Well, as Adam said, thanks everybody for joining us on uh, this beautiful Thursday morning, sitting inside as opposed to the sun, so we, we all appreciate it. Joined here by Steve Sarsky, CMO, Mamba Sports Academy. The name didn't give it away, maybe it's the shoes, but <laughs> it's uh, Kobe Bryant's latest sort of business venture. He got involved in it back in December of 2018, and he's been on board for just a few months now as CMO. Kind of explain for anybody that hasn't heard about what Mamba Sports Academy is and what Kobe is trying to make it, what exactly your guys' goals are there. For sure, for sure. First and foremost, thank you all for having me. Um, it's funny being on stage talking to you guys. Kobe and I were discussing this last night. He's very, I would say, micro-detailed. He wants to be involved. So he's like, oh, you're talking? Here's a couple points I want you to hit on. <laughs> I was like, all right, that's like a little bit of pressure, you know? Yeah, and yeah. Um, Pressure on me, too. That's good. You know? Yeah, nah, like, he wouldn't hire you either. And I was, <laughs> yeah, um, fair enough. He won't fire you either way, though, so you're good. Um, no, but, um, you know, we were just discussing it, and one of the big things that I was brought on is to really, you know, brand the gym and brand the facility and brand the venture and what we're trying to do with it. And what we like to say is, you know, there's other gyms out there right now that are national or even international. They have hundreds of doors, thousands of doors, and they're very successful at what they do, and it's very hard to get into an industry that's kind of already, someone has a stranglehold on it. But what we're doing is entirely different. Um, if you go to one of those facilities, you see a lot of people there either there to play ball or there to work out with the goal of maybe losing weight or blowing off some steam after a long day of work. And for us, that's not the goal at all. Um, everything is training with a purpose. Everything involves a performance aspect to it and a sports aspect to it. Um, so, for example, if you come and work out with us, your goal is, I want to get better at X. Um, I want to be a better baseball player. I want to be a better runner. I want to be a better football player, a better tennis player, a better hockey player, a better soccer player. I want to be a better CEO. We have cognitive training for that. So it's always with focus oriented and there's a purposeful behind it. And the second part that we're doing something I would say entirely different from anyone else in the industry is it is all youth oriented at its core. So what we really want to do is be a hub for the eight year old or the 12 year old or the 16 year old that has an interest and has a love for a sport and really wants to see themselves get to the next level. So if you go to a name, any gym, LA Fitness, Equinox, et cetera, et cetera, it's a lot of people our age or older trying to shed some of that summer, you know, set, shed some of that winter weight to get ready for the summer, right? Get my summer bod. And we're like, if that's your goal, like we're probably not the place for you. Our goal is that kid in middle school who's like, hey, you season is coming up. This is my big chance. Um, I really want to get better. I really want to make the middle school team. It's the kid who plays JV football and is like, I'm solid. And I really would just want to see how good I could be if I put my all into it. So we have performance training. We'll get you in the weight room and train you specifically for that sport. So it's different depending on what your goal is. And then we actually have the courts and the facility to then train you in that sport as well. So we have top QB coaches, um, top offensive line coaches, people who will actually get you better at what you want to work at. And what we say is for the kid, that's very easy. For a 12 year old, you want to get better at your sport. It's like, that's great. But we say like adults are welcome too. And what we want to do is bring out what we would say that inner kid. We want to, you know, you're 40 years old, whatever it might be. You're like, I love running. I just don't have a chance anymore. And now I don't really want to get back out there because I put on too much weight or I haven't ran in a long time or I blew out my hamstring when I was 25 and haven't really gone back out there. It's like, no, we'll help you get back to where you need to be. There's no reason that at any age you should have to give up on what your dream was. And <clears throat> no, you're not going to the NFL if you're 45 years old. Probably not going to the NFL, you know, if you're 18 years old. But what we could do is get you to a place where like, you know, I feel as good as I ever have at doing what I do. And now when I'm in the room with my friends, I feel like I feel good about myself. I feel like I can go and do this. Or if I want to go play in a Sunday league or a weekend league, you know, our goal is to make weekend warriors more than what they are right now. So what we say is we better the best and we help the best get better. And that's Kobe's mantra. And that's what we try to live every day. And <laughs> when people say, and sorry for being so long-winded, but you're like, <laughs> give the intro. I'm like, there's a lot to say. Yeah, it's fair. Um, you know, when people are like, where do you want to be in a couple of years? Or what is the goal? And, um, you know, I haven't vetted this by any of the bosses. So sorry, Chad and Kobe. But my, my big thing is I want to be in a spot in five years, let's say, um, where there's not a single rookie going into any league. Doesn't matter what sport we're talking about because we're multi-sport. We don't want any player going into any league that hasn't been touched by us in some way whether that's a summer tournament, whether that's a weekend camp, whether that's training with us for months at a time. 
We want to touch every kid who's on an elite level, and we want to be part of the reason that they're on an elite level. And um, again, whether that's in our facility, satellites, camps, whether that's you know applications and apps that we're working on, in some way they're going to have touched Mama Sports Academy, and it's going to help them get to where they want to go. And no, we don't need the recognition for that, but they'll know that we were part of that journey. When you think about differentiating yourselves in that way from an Equinox or something, and, and really sort of lean into that branding of messaging around performance, and especially to youth, how are you guys looking at you know, connecting to that audience? Are there specific ways that, or methods that you think are gonna be really sort of keep your success? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, let's keep it a buck. We got Kobe Bryant. So if we're trying to <laughs> connect to a kid who loves sports, you already have that pinnacle guy. Um, I'd say the second thing is, is we're really involved with Muses. And so what we do is we have a lot of pro athletes who work out with us. NFL guys train for the draft with us. NBA guys train for the draft with us. And then guys come in the off season. We have innumerable guys there right now. And we don't have like a separate VIP section. They work out hand in hand with the young kids. They work out hand in hand with everyone who comes into our facility. And no, we make sure there's no fanboying or fangirling. But we let everyone work out next to their muse so that they can see, oh, what they're doing isn't different than what I'm doing. You know what I mean? And it's not like, oh, they're otherworldly or they're different than us. It's like, they're doing it, I'm doing it. Maybe I can get to the same place. It's, it's more inspirational than aspirational. It's like, I can do it. And uh, so when you talk about like branding and, you know, Again, this industry wasn't my background, so a lot of it was catching up on it when I first came in. But, sure. um, you know, I don't think there are that many, let's call them gyms or fitness centers that have the kind of marketing teams that we have that are so focused on social media. You know, we're a very young company and we feel like where we're going as far as social and where we're going as far as marketing and brand equity, other people aren't as focused on that. Again, a lot of them are already successful without it. So it's like, why invest in marketing? People are already coming into our doors. Great, amazing. And for us, it's like, no, we really want to build a brand. We really want to stand for something and be something. So when you see our logo, you already know what you're getting into mm -hmm. and you're getting into the best. Now you mentioned before your background. So you sort of broke into the sports industry through, I guess, journalism in a lot of ways and, and through SLAM. I mean, what did you sort of learn in that experience, learning about basketball and that side of the game that you think kind of sets yourself up for success now, sort of in this role? For sure, yeah, I was a broke journalist for a long time. <laughs> um, I was lucky enough coming no out of college, it, I got an internship at Slam Magazine, um, and I ended up staying there for about five years. Again, worked my way from an intern, uh, right at the heart of the financial crisis, um, 08, 09. Worked my way from an intern all the way to you know second in command and at a small company like Slam Magazine, probably like a front office sports, you wear many hats. So I was an editor, I was a writer, but I was also on the publishing side helping bring in deals. And it's, uh, you know, what I like to say is my next step, the way that helped me is I wore so many hats. I was a journalist, so my communication skills were pretty good, although saying that feels awkward. <laughs> but um, I was a, like, you're not a good communicator if you say you're a good communicator. But I feel like I was all right. Um, probably lost it by now. But, um, you know, you're able to kind of amortize that and bring that to everything that you do. And so, one of the big things was I went to Stance thereafter, Stance Socks, and at the time it was really just a surf and skate company. And they decided that they wanted to get into sports, you know, NBA, MLB, we kind of knew that was on the radar. And so they brought me in to help run those wings. And what they did was they created verticals where basketball has a category director and baseball has a category director. And I ended up being the category director for both and, and skate and snow and they each had their own vertical. And the most important thing was everyone in the building had the skill set of how to build product um, you know, and all the like minutia on the back end, but what they really didn't have was that user interface. And so for me, it's like, okay, we're launching a category. What's the first thing we want to do? We want to land with a splash. We want to make a bang. We want to get the name out there. So having come from the journalism side, having been in media rooms with so many people that are going to help get the message out um, for free was like the best Chico that we had out of the gates to the point where my old boss was joking, like I'm never not, I'm never hiring someone again who hasn't worked in journalism because what you're getting for free costs like a million dollars, you know? <laughs> and um, I did not get paid a million dollars though. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like you said, Stance had this crazy evolution from being kind of a, a very niche brand in a lot of ways to now having league deals, now having partnerships with any sort of, me you know, media entities in a lot of ways. I mean. What do you think were sort of keys to its growth? I mean, you, keep, you hit on some of them there, but when you look back sort of on that journey, were there other sort of elements of how you guys leaned into either the, 
brand ethos from the beginning, or even as sort of the, as that evolved co going into other sports that helped, do you think? Yeah, so we were super lucky. Stance early on established itself in the lifestyle space, right? And so they were cool with the skaters. And it was perfect timing because skater, everyone was just trying to tap into that world. And so for us, when we're talking to the NBA and MLB, it's like, hey, you're already in a lot of the doors that we want to be in that we can't get into. And we're like, great, you're in a lot of the doors that we want to be in. So let's get this perfect marriage of we'll open up the lifestyle space to you and you'll open up the lifestyle, the license space to us. And honestly, it worked out beautifully for both parties. You know, I think the first thing we worked on of note was, you know, becoming the official sock of uh, the NBA and becoming the on-court sock. And, you know, I think I'll just, I mean, this will be in my own obituary if I write it I'll probably write my own obituary and it'll say like we were the first visible logo on court in the NBA you know now Nike has it etc but Adidas was tucked into the jock strap like you had to tuck that into your jersey our logo was visible on the sock and now it's funny like that goes without saying that's across every league it's pretty much across every sport we've done it in baseball since then but at the time it was pretty revolutionary and um, getting the deal done with the NBA, I was lucky to be a part of that. Um, you know, Clark Miyasaki, who's one of my mentors, um, really spearheaded that. And we were able to dive in and really be like, here's what we can offer to you, here's what you can offer to us. Yes, there's money, yes, there's revenue opportunities, but more than that, there's brand equity for both brands. The NBA can tap into this cool world and we can tap into the NBA world. T, we want you to do that for stance because you know the NBA world. NBA, we're gonna teach you how to play in the lifestyle space a little bit, not that they need our help that much, and it was a beautiful marriage. I think to your point though, it seems like more and more lifestyle brands are available to work in sports properties, and like you said, sports properties wanna make sure they're taking advantage of that brand equity, even if it's a smaller piece of the pie in terms of like the larger fandom of the NBA, there's a lot of value Sort of being with a brand like Stance or some of the other partnerships or any of these leagues for that matter. Yeah, but then you look at it in reverse. If you're a Stance, if you're a Mama Sports Academy, if you're a Nike, if you're anyone, mm -hmm. um, you know, we kind of work off of this X, Y axis of revenue and brand equity. And usually you want to be in that upper right quadrant of it's bringing in revenue and sure. there's brand equity there. You know what I mean? So, oh, great, a collab with Supreme. You're going to make a crap load of money and it's great for your brand. To sign a deal and put out Harry Potter merch, for instance, you're gonna make a ton of money. Is that good for your brand? Who knows? You know, that's like bottom right. And then you wanna be in these two worlds. You never wanna be in, you know, the left side of that access, top or bottom, because even if it's bringing revenue, if it's costing you enough brand equity, is the trade off really worth it? Sure. Probably not. Not if you are in it for the long game. Yeah. Does it, do you think it's hard to sort of evaluate that to a certain degree? Does it come through just experience or just. <clears throat> it's hard, but not even because like of the evolution or the evaluation. It's hard because at the end of the day, most of us, or whether you're private or public, you probably have VC money. You probably have goals you need to hit. You probably have people you need to answer to who are pushing you to bring in more money every quarter. And when they see low hanging fruit, they're like, why aren't you grabbing that? And it's like, I'm not grabbing that because it is so low hanging, because that couple of million dollars is so dirty that in four or five years, we will not be able to make the next 10 to $20 million down the line because we made that quick money. And that's a constant battle, that's a constant fight. And um, you know, you win some, you lose some, hopefully the ones that you lose, if you're good at marketing and branding, you can bury it enough where you make that revenue without ever having to talk about it so it doesn't actually sell your brand. Uh, speaking of kind of answering to somebody, you're following your own sort of entrepreneurial and things as well, going sort of in your love of sneakers a little bit. Uh, tell us about tell us about what you're doing with laces and, and that sort of stuff. For sure, for sure. I, just to take it back a step, the best thing is, is I've never worked in a corporate gig. I was at Slam, which at the time had like 10, maybe 10 full-time employees. Um, probably not even that, to be honest. Stance, when I got there, was 60 people. Um, Mamba right now, we probably have, you know, somewhere in the two figures, full-time employees. And when you're in that space, again, you wear many hats. You get to learn a lot of things. I was a 25-year-old sitting with the NBA and MLB and getting to be involved in you know, multi-million dollar negotiations and involved in minutia and sitting with lawyers. And I had no place in that room, but I was allowed to be in that room because A, those brands valued me for what I brought to the table. And then B, it was like, yeah, like we don't have to have eight people in here. So if you want to come along, we'll let you do that. We'll let you get that experience. And so I've benefited from being in rooms I had no place you know, being in. And I've met people, whether that's venture capitalists or whether that's accountants, lawyers, et cetera, anywhere down the line, players, agents, et cetera. And so for me, um, you know, I would say my biggest thing as far as marketing, my biggest focus is always interpersonal relationships. And I think that goes for everyone in the room, like try to be like a genuine person. And so for me, 
just the kind of the cobbling together of all those relationships at a certain point in time, I'm like, hey, I have an idea. And it was honestly, I feel like everything's been done, right? A lot of brands pitch themselves like, I'm the Uber of X. That's what you go and say to a venture capitalist, or I am the stance of X. Um, and you're like, I'm the most unique, I'm the original, I'm the first person in this space. And so a couple of years ago, I'm a big sneakerhead. I worked in socks. I'm like, no one is really doing anything. The only untouched canvas still to this day is laces. Like, no one's really doing anything. The big brands aren't playing in it, Nike, Adidas, et cetera. It's not worth their time to spend the money um, or the R&D, like, figuring out what to do in that space. And so myself and a couple of friends were like, there's no, um, no one's doing it. You know, there's a lot of expression there. There's a lot of freedom there. If you go to a corporate office, you can mess around with it. If you like wearing, uh, you know, just a plain pair of Nike Force Ones, like, you could do something with it. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, recently we were able to raise, you know, seven figures in capital off the strength of, I would say, again, relationships, ideas, having been in rooms that we had no place being in, but learning from that and being able to meet the right people. Yeah. Well, like you said, through that relationships, that gives you guys a platform with that company to really sort of move into different spaces. Like you said, I mean, it can be as easy as a partnership with a league or a team or a player or letting them design their own sort of thing. I mean, there's a lot of creative platforms that can come out of that. Yeah, yeah, most brands uh, overpay, in my opinion, to work with players, right? Like, again, going back to that access, what is the actual value in working with some of those players? But when you can get something for free from those players, it's great. So when we were launching that brand, we had a bunch of NBA players on the homie level wear it on court for us. And then you get that visibility, you can parlay that into any number of things because ultimately it has a lot of value, especially if you're not putting much into it to get that return. Sure, so as, as you sort of look out the evolution of Mamba Sports Academy and you know, to, to your point earlier on kind of how you guys develop this brand, are there, are there certain spaces, whether that's social media, digital, through app, through the website, that, that you're looking at sort of, this is gonna be kind of where we're gonna really sort of make our money, if you will. Yeah, I don't even want to say make our money, but oh, where, we're gonna, where we're gonna, I would say, claim our stake is again in that youth space, again in that purposeful training space. But even more than that, we have what we call 360 training. And it is you come in and we actually have uh, physicians on, on staff. And if you've ever been to P3 in Santa Barbara, you know that when you go in there, a lot of athletes go in there when they're graduating or when they're about to go pro. They go in there and you get evaluated. We have the same evaluation process. You come in with us in day one, we look at what your deficiencies are from the standpoint of this is what we need to work on, but also, hey, you have a bad knee, let's stay away from X, Y, and Z. And it goes 360 from there. We'll get you, <coughs> excuse me, we'll get you warmed up properly. There's an entire, a lot of time spent on warm up, which we all know now is important. There's a training properly, this is sports training properly. Then we have recovery room, and then we have actually cognition training as well which is a training your mind, right? The last great space, again, that's kind of untouched. In my opinion, no matter what team you play for, you probably have a great trainer. They might have different philosophies, but in 2019, every team has a great training staff versus even, I would say, 2000. Not every team was on the same level. But what every team is not doing is training the mind. And so there are certain players already in the elite space who are doing that, um, and we've seen kind of how it gets them ahead and how you can sharpen your focus and how if you become a little bit smarter in your reaction time, a little bit quicker in reading a room, how that can make a difference for you, whether you're a player or a businessman. And uh, we're working a lot with that right now with players. Actually, again, another differentiating point is within Sports Academy, we have a venture lab, which is, again, solely focused on incubating, um, I would say, whether it's apps or ideas that kind of um, increase human performance. That's like the main goal for that. And so right now we're working on an app that's gonna launch shortly um, with the blessing of Kobe and a bunch of pro athletes. And again, the whole goal is how do you become a better decision maker? Or how do you actually work out your mind? Uh, again, it's, it's the great unknown, it's the great white space. And in the weight room, there's only so much you can do. And again, you only have so much time in the day. But our big thing is, hey, instead of scrolling Instagram or while you're recovery sitting with some Norma Tech boots on, why are you just like laying back and closing your eyes? Like we'll give you an app that can actually help you in those 20 minutes so you're not wasting any moment of your day. And again, those top athletes are already doing it. So what we want to do is bring that to the masses and make it where you're not surprised when you're hearing this. Make it, you know, like the last five minutes of your workout always are going to involve mental exercises because your mind, again, is going to be the motor for everything that you do. Well, I'm sure something like that, too. That's where, you know, you guys can take it from just being sort of youth focused to maybe bring in some like, you know, C-suite sort of folks in the, in the room 
sort of bring different, maybe some sales people in the room and, and sort of get, let them sort of say, you know. Yeah, we do a ton on the corporate level, but the whole thought is if you're working with youth, right, how many people are actually gonna become professionals sure. in no, their sure. avenue, but everyone will end up being in a room like this, will end up being an executive, whether it's marketing, sales, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, hopefully they take these <laughs> lessons, they take some of the cognitive training that we've done and they apply that to what they're doing. So our big thing and a big example that we use, and Jason Sada runs our lab and he's, done a lot of work with Mark Cuban in the past, done a lot of work with the leagues in the past, and very smart, very educated person. And his big example he gives as a general is when you're driving from point A to point B, maybe from your house to work, you do it all the time. Sometimes you get there and you're like, I don't even remember how I got here. Like, I don't, did I run a red light when I got here? Did I run a stop sign? I don't recall the ride at all. And like, sometimes you're like, damn, like, that probably isn't good. And we're like, no, that's actually best case. You don't even, you're processing that so quickly that you don't even realize that you're processing it. And when you're doing that, it means your mind can now focus on tasks A, B, and C, because that other one becomes so tertiary and so normal to you that you don't have to think about it. So now you're a decision maker in a room, you don't even have to think about basic decisions because they're so obvious to you. And now you can focus on those levels that maybe other people aren't seeing. Um, and that's what we want to bring to the world, again, through youth, but leveling it all the way up. You mentioned before, going obviously from journalism to, to this role now, communication has been something that really has helped you on that path as well as sort of that relationship building. When Now that you deal with a lot of folks that probably just have always done sales, always done branding, always done marketing, what are some other maybe pitfalls you see that some of them fall into that you know, maybe you see differently as a journalist that you give advice for the room in that way or maybe even what are some other tools that you feel like are in your school skill set? From yeah, the, the biggest thing is like, for me, again, coming from the journalism background, I used to get pitches all day, whether it was on the sneaker side, and it's like you have to write about it because anything to do with sneakers is gonna get clicks, or it's from a brand that has an idea, a player that is investing in a new property. Everyone's pitching you everything, literally 50, 100 emails a day, and you're trying to decipher like what's good. So now when you're on the marketing side, it's like I've already seen the best pitches, I've seen the worst pitches, I know good ideas, I know bad ideas. One thing that I talk about, um, as far as like an idea that I saw when I was on the journalism side. Um, and, I, and I say this with all due respect and love to the brand. Nike came out with Nike Plus probably about 2010, 2011. And it was basically your sneaker. I mean, it was in a Hyperdunk and a couple other their Plus versions at the time where it could track how high you could jump, how fast you could run, and like compare it to your friends. And as a journalist at the time, I was like, yeah, I have to cover this. I'm going to cover it. But if you would have asked me internally what my feedback is, it's, do I actually want to know that I can't jump? Do I actually want to know that I'm slow as shit? Do I actually want to know that my friends are faster than me? Like, it's probably information best left unsaid and unlearned. So for me, it's like, I'm gonna write about it, I'm gonna cover it, you're gonna give us some ad money, we're definitely gonna take it, I'm not turning down a nice, you know, buy. But at the end of the day, like, of course it was gone within a couple of months. And I think, hopefully, I've taken that to where I am, where I can analyze an idea and be like, hey, what is the pitch gonna look like? How am I putting together that first email? Um, if I'm hiring a PR firm, you know, how are they putting that together? Like the minutia matters on that first point of contact. And it's amazing how some big brands, not that one, but other big brands will send you these shittiest pitches for an idea that they put millions of dollars into. And I'm like, that's your first email? Like that's what you're sending us? That's your pitch? And so for me, it's like my, my first interaction with you has to be the best interaction. And I want everyone thereafter to be just as good. But if I'm not putting my best foot forward, and it's like, fuck, I'm, I'm dead from the start. You know, so I would say we take that in our everyday. Like, you gotta tell a great story from A to Z. If you're not doing it at A, it doesn't matter if your plans for X, Y, and Z are great, you're not gonna get there. Yeah. And so, yeah, you can basically vet yourself a little bit better from that mindset. Are there, are there specific brands out there that now that you're more in this sort of sports performance world that, that you, you think their approach is really good? Or, you know, I guess the Nike example is the opposite of that, but. Yeah, and it's funny because they so quickly rewrote that and did so well what they did next. But, you know, one big one that I'm, I like a lot right now, and it's funny because I work with them, but Hyperice is a brand out of Irvine, and, and they're young in the training space, and it's like a, a lot of, um, I'm sure you guys all know what it is, but what they're doing as far as the technology is game-altering. And then the way that they're putting the package together is amazing. They're partnering with the right athletes, not with, like, the coolest athletes, but with the guys that you look up to as, oh, my God, that's the guy that has the best body, has the best physique, or never gets hurt. And, like, what is he doing and how can I do it? So to me, Hype Rice is, like, the perfect technology, the perfect pitch, mm -hmm. the perfect place. And it's funny because we were saying earlier, like, now that space is filling up quickly. There's a lot of companies that are coming out with vibrating rollers and the next big thing. And it's like, yeah, but they're still doing it best. And, you know. Yeah, I'm sure that, I mean, probably the same for you guys now at Mom Sports Academy, getting those athletes that 
they really buy into that messaging. They're going to come into the facility that are going to see what you guys are giving them and benefit from it and then evangelize it in ways that doesn't come off as sort of phony. It's like, no, this is actually the best thing for us as athletes and that, that's what's going to draw the people in, just like high price. 100%. And as I said, we, like, we look at these athletes as muses, right? And we give them that best experience and the, everyone else sees that best experience and wants it and we offer that same experience to everyone. And I would say the way we then leverage it is we'll host youth basketball camps all summer. And when I ask a guy to come appear at the camp, versus maybe some other camps. I don't have to accompany it with a huge check. I can be like, like, hey, you're about to have a great season. We helped you get there. Now we're asking you to spend a couple hours with kids who have been looking up to you in the building. Come spend the day with them and let them play ball with you. Let them work out with you. Show them how you do it you know, and, and interact with them. And it's much easier for me to make that ask and knowing that I've done something for them. Whereas if you're at a different brand, even at Stan selling socks, it's like, I, hey, I'm giving you socks. Like, I'm not doing something great for the world or for you. You know what I mean? Like, it's amazing. I love it. Best product, but like, it's not game changing. Now it's like, I'm working out with you this summer. I'm going to make sure that you come into training camp and your coach is like, holy shit. Now all I need is one hour from you. And that's an easy ask, and it's usually an easy answer as well. Sure. So we've gone over a couple of topics. We want to make sure you open up to the room as well. Anybody wants to touch on anything, uh, whether it's Mama Sports Academy, what shoes he thinks are cool, <laughs> you can kind of throw it out there. Uh, I don't think we have a mic, but it's a small room, so just project. I'm sure everybody can. Hopefully somebody's got something, so I'm not. Oh, appreciate it. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, thank you, by the way, for the conversation. It was great. Um, in terms of kind of your strategy for location of facilities, what is that? Oh, in terms of uh, location um, as it relates to you know, kind of opening facilities for, for Mamba Sports Academies. What does it currently look like and kind of what's that expansion strategy look like over time? For sure, for sure. So right now we have an 100,000 square foot facility in Thousand Oaks, pretty close to the Rams facility as it happens, pretty close to Calabasas where a lot of guys live in the off season. Um, I would say the second thing we're strategizing on is ways to bring consumer products to houses where people don't need to be close to a facility and or doing satellite camps where we can put a speed camp on in your neighborhood and don't even, you know, we can kind of reach a deal with the facility on that. But I would say yes, the near and long term goal is to kind of look at how we can expand, where we can expand. And as far as the idea, I think this goes for everyone in the room, like we really want to own a region kind of before you globalize. So for us, SoCal is our home, SoCal is Kobe's home, SoCal is Chad Faulkner, the CEO's home. And uh, we'd love to own the neighborhood before we go and knock on a bigger door. You mentioned having two different kind of audiences. One, you said about the JV football team and one more like the elite athletes who you want to touch before they get to the next level. How do you brand? Because it's kind of two different focuses. It's all about being your best self, but if I'm a JV kid versus a you know, 15 year old in the top 100 for basketball, I'm kind of looking for two different things. How do you brand that to reach both audiences? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, they're both looking for the same thing. They both want to reach the peak of their potential. They both want to be the best at what they do. For that kid who can only throw the football 15 yards, it might be the freshman team. But hey, we can make you a damn good freshman quarterback. For you know another kid who might be an 11th grader who's a top 30 prospect and really wants to break into the top 10, it's, it's the same pitch. It's the same workout, really. It's the same ideas. And you might put in more time. You might, you know, you should, if you're at that point, kind of be like, I'm about to make some money. Let me go all in on this. Um, but but it's, it's the same pitch. It's the same idea. It's the same workout. It's the same end goal. We're going to put the same energy in. Assuming you both put the same energy in, hopefully you'll both see the results you want. And I mean, to me, it's, it's funny. Like what we say like this, and I just joked about it, but like one of our big pitches is, you know, if you can only throw the football 15 yards, you might only be able to throw the football 15 yards. Maybe we can get you to 20. But what we can help you do is be able to read the defense better. We can make your footwork a little better. We can make sure that your three-step drop is cleaner. We can make sure that you know how to read a field. And we can make it where you will maximize your ability within that space. Same thing in basketball. Maybe we can add a few inches to your vert. We definitely can. We have great trainers. But thereafter, we can actually make you a better basketball player. And that's kind of the differentiator for us is you go into an LA Fitness and Equinox, like, great, you're going to get a workout and your body fat will drop a few points. Ours is like, no, like, we'll target those areas that you want. We'll make you better at what you want to do. You know, so again, if the goal is to lose like 30 pounds because you want to look good in a bathing suit, like, we'll see you on the other side. <laughs> but if the goal is like you really have a goal in mind and you want to accomplish something, we're going to get you there and faster than anyone else and better than anyone else. And we're starting to tell those stories. Honestly, when I came in, Kobe had only joined the venture in December. 
Um, so we're pretty new, and when I came in, one of the first things I've been working on, which we're about to put out, is really just like a brand bible of here's what we stand for, here's what we are, here's what we want people to be. So every time we come into a room, we're usually explaining ourselves verbally. It's like, no, like here's the basics of it, right? And we do so many things that it's hard to get that message across, right? Like, oh, like how, but at the end of the day, it's all the same. Make, you know, we would say, be your best self and better your best. And, um, you know, that, that's kind of what it is. Does being in all sports like that, like obviously I guess the <clears throat> basketball and football are probably two of the main things, but I know you guys are also looking at esports in that space too and building some facilities around that. Does having that wide touch points or all sort of sports, does that strengthen, you think, that brand message a little bit? Yeah, I would say, look, it's hard, right? It would be easy. If we were just in basketball, Kobe is the ambassador, Anthony Davis working out at the gym every day, um, you know, young high school players, top 10 prospects working out with us every day, we can own the basketball space, I would think, with all mm. of that behind us. But we want to do every sport, which is very difficult, right? But at the end of the day, yeah, it strengthens us. We actually just uh, signed a deal with the Dodgers Training Academy a couple days ago. Where we're going to partner with them on baseball training. So they're going to do the baseball aspect of it, hitting, fielding, et cetera, at our location at Redondo Beach with a new location. But we're going to do all the performance training with the Mamba method. And so at the end of the day, what you're going to have is us doing that, I believe, in the long term in a lot of sports. You know, And right now, we're training one of the top tennis players who's still in Wimbledon. And it's like funny. like It makes sense, a high school kid in basketball spaces, like I'm training with the Mamba mentality. It's like, great, like that makes sense. Kobe was a hooper. But it's like, no, we're bringing that across all elements, across all ethos. I'm sure you guys have seen Kobe's writing a lot of uh, YA books in the fantasy space. First one came out, it was about basketball. He's another one about to come out about tennis. It only makes sense for us to be in the tennis space. And we joke about it all the time, you know, and he wrote about it in his book, Mamba Mentality. Like, it applies to everything. Right, all of us in the room. It applies to hoops, obviously, but like it, it kind of been galvanized across all brands, across all elements, and why not? You know, it shouldn't just be limited to hoops. A baseball player can tap into that same ethos and reach that same goal. Got one in the back left, I think. No, yeah. Oh, fair enough. Uh, what's the evaluation process like for brand partners that want to? work with you guys because obviously Nike body armor are things within Kobe's ecosystem obviously you're gonna work with for new partners what's that look like yeah I would say for us honestly there's a major element of less is more and um, you know we were talking about this a little bit earlier but you know Kobe made an appearance at the ESPYs last night and when he took the stage really just to introduce Bill Russell one of his heroes and mentors Kobe himself got a standing ovation and I was sitting in the crowd and I'm like, why is Kobe getting a standing ovation right now? He's getting that standing O because he doesn't come out that often. People are excited to see him because he makes himself scarce. And we're kind of in the same scarcity model. Like we wanna limit and be very strategic with our partnerships. The second you start taking every check that comes your way or partnering with every brand that comes your way, you might as well not partner with any brands because it all gets lost in the chaos and the fog. So I would rather pick three, four, five strategic partners tell full stories with them, invest a lot of money and a lot of time with them, and now we're gonna do something special. Whereas, yeah, I could sign 10 deals tomorrow for six figures. At the end of the day, it'll be a great year, but all of them will be unhappy, I'll be unhappy. What do we do next, you know? Second question, who was your favorite person to work with at SLAM? Yeah. Spoiler, spoiler alert, I worked with them at SLAM. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know what, honestly, um, I'm sure it's the same for a lot of you guys. I, I think a lot of breaking into this industry, whether it's marketing or specifically sports and sports and marketing, I think a lot of it has to do with luck. Um, there are so many people that want to be in the sports space. There's like colleges are overflowing with kids taking these programs. I'm sure you guys do. I get emails every day from a kid like, I want to do what you do, or I want to be an agent, or I want to work with this team and that team, and how do I get there? And I'm like, A, be lucky as fuck. <laughs> B, work hard as shit. See, there's just, that, there's just that element of like, when I got my job at SLAM that summer before my, in college, I cold emailed, and this was, you know, just cold emailed every single publication. And one guy, Ben Osborne, who was the editor-in-chief at SLAM at the time, and now is the editor-in-chief at Bleacher Report, got back to me and was like, I don't have anything for you now, but come back in a couple months. Where he's like, hit me on October 1st, swear to God, like 12.01, you know, I waited till like midnight, and this was before he could schedule an email, I hit him. He's like, yo, you're sick, come in tomorrow. <laughs> you know, and so like we kind of like Ben's obviously my hero, you know, that's my idol, that's my mentor. Um, you know, like I was saying, the, the beauty of working at smaller brands and it's not to knock working at, uh, you know, Pizza Hut, incredible, amazing opportunity. It's not to knock working at the Rams or the Chargers, but the beauty of working at a small brand is 
you get to like work hand in hand with your CEO, your mentor, you know, your editor, whatever it might be. So at Stance, I was working day in and day out with Jeff Curl, who's the founder and CEO, John Wilson, the president, the CFO, and these guys who have already kind of made it and are where I want to be or are where we all want to be. And they were willing, A, to open their doors and offices, but B, willing to be like, yo, jump in on this meeting, or yo, I'm going to San Francisco to meet with some VCs, Just hop in the room. I'm like, why the fuck am I in this room? Like, I should be bringing you Aquafina right now. <laughs> um, I don't get a check. Um, ho hopefully, y'all do. Um, and it's just like, to me, that's the benefit. So a lot of times people hit me like, yo, how do I get in with the Rams? And I'm like, yo, I would actually start with like that smaller team, if, if that makes sense for you. Because working with that with AAA you know, baseball club or working with LAFC or working with something in maybe a different smaller space potentially, although LAFC isn't smaller, but doing something in a different space will like help you learn the tools that you need so that when you get called up to the big leagues, you already have everything in your toolbox and you can get to work, you know? And for me and Sean, same for you, you know, just, just putting in the time at some of those brands, I mean, you fill your bag up, you know what I mean? You fill your bag up and it's not like working at some of these larger companies where your role is like super segmented. It's like, I focus just on this, literally. I just write press releases. I just do this, I just do that. I just work on digital. It's like, no, like, I've worked on all of that. And so luckily, if you get that opportunity and you take advantage of it and learn as much as you can from these smart and talented and successful people, now you have all those tools yourself and, and someone else will pay you for those tools. Anybody else got anything? Firstly, thank you for insights. Uh, you mentioned earlier the four pitches uh, that you received by your email. But on the other side, what were the best pitches and why? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's funny. At different brands, I've had a lot of good different pitches. But um, from a, you know, I would say when I was on the journalism side, some of the best pitches were just the most esoteric, esoteric stories. People would send fully written, already brief, like, yo, it's not like, yo, I want to write this. Put me in a position to write it. Like, yo, I already wrote this. I already talked to all the key players. I just need a home for it. And sometimes I'm like, man, the hustle is so great. I'm going to put you on. And I'll open the Word doc, and it's like, this is fucking terrible. We're going to edit the shit out of this. But the hustle was so real that we're going to let you put your name on it. You know, we'll make it look good where you'll get the next job. And in my mind, I'm thinking of someone specifically now who's like a real journalist, like in a major location with like a full-time job. And I'm like, you couldn't write. And I don't know if you can now or if your editor is doing all the work. <laughs> but, but you could put together a beautiful pitch and you knew how to get people to talk to you. And, and that's the majority of the battle. You know, at Stance, we used to get pitches from brands all the time who wanted to work with us. And a lot of times, again, going back to that XY of brand equity and revenue, these people would kind of already know that and be like, I don't know if we're going to make a ton of money. We're selling a product that sells for 10 bucks a pop but here's what I can bring to you as a brand, and here's where we're gonna go, and here's I can open this new space for you. And if you kind of understand your audience, which is the battle for us on the marketing side, but also the battle from the journalism side, like you're putting yourself in a position to win. Um, yeah. I would say uh, the last thing that you know, I, would, I would say, and again, it's just the perspective of what we have of like thinking differently and really just like swerving left when people think you should be going right and when things are like obvious and industry standard actually being like why is this industry standard and one thing i love you know in my head i'm always like this doesn't make sense to me um last night i was at the SBS, the after party two chains comes on um the night before i was at an event yg came on and in my head i'm like these guys are getting paid for this good for them good for their agents good for their record labels um <laughs> But I'm like, at the end of the day, like, do you really need to be paying someone 25K, 50K, 100K to do like six songs at one of these events where A, by the time they come on, everyone's already drunk. B, I'm actually there for the conversation. C, if you get a good DJ for a 10th of the price, what could you then do with that 90K, that 20K that you saved? Like, how could you actually spend that money in a smart way? And again, I've been at smaller brands, Slam, Stance, even if we're nine figures in revenue, we're smaller than some of these other brands. And the idea is like, man, with $25,000, like, what could I do? Like, I could do a lot, and it wouldn't be pay YG. You know what I mean? And then 25 is a joke, because it's more like 100. But again, just like every dollar counts when you're on that smaller side. And no matter who I'm working with, no matter how big the brand gets, um, I'll always be cheap. Not because I'm cheap, but because like the power of the dollar and the way that you can stretch that, it's incredible. And whether that's, again, getting things for free and or just leveraging you know what I mean? Sure. And thinking like, what is the best way to actually spend money? And what is the best thing that you can do with your time? 
And um, again, shout out to YG, love him. Um, <laughs> I worked for XXL for a minute, and he was a freshman, and amazing, tooted and booted. Um, but um, uh, he's different now. But um, yeah, it's just like, sometimes I'm just like, why are we doing things? Oh, because other people do it? Like, shit doesn't make sense to me. I know it doesn't make sense to Chad Faulkner, so you know, I know it doesn't make sense to Kobe. It's like, think about every decision you make. Don't do things because people are doing them. Like, right. usually, they're doing it because the person before them did it. And guess what? That person got fired and or was working in the 80s or 90s, and it's 2019. So we're constantly reevaluating, like, what the industry standard is, why it's the standard. And honestly, if it doesn't make sense, all right, we're not going to do it. And um, honestly, that's like that's my biggest thing, day in and day out. We're just looking at like what the norm is and why is it the norm. And if it shouldn't be the norm, we're not gonna do it. And you might laugh at us or question us, but hopefully in two or three years, what we're doing is already the new norm. Probably got time for one more. If there's anybody in the room that still got something? Yes, no? Oh. We'll do two more. Okay. You tied. <laughs> um, what are your goals when you walk into the moment? Yeah, every day or? Yeah, every day. I mean, shit, my goal is to accumulate as many wins as possible every day. I was just talking to my wife on my drive out here. Um, every night before I go to sleep, I write down one thing that I want to accomplish the next day. Just one thing. And I'm sure you're all the same. I'm getting hundreds of emails. I'm on Slack. I'm on Asana. I have a lot of tasks. There's a lot of communication. I have meetings. Um, but there's just one win I want to get every single day. And it's funny because Coach Calhoun touched on this last night at the ESPYs, but if you can get one win every day and just keep that momentum going, you'll be good. Because by the same token, when I go to sleep every night, there's always one thing I didn't get to that I wanted to. There's always something that you're not going to get to. There's, the work is never done. The second it's done, you're either fired or retired. Hopefully retired, but you know. Um, so for me, it's just like focus on what you can actually do. Set a goal in mind. You know, right now at Mama, for instance, we're about to launch this app on the Venture Lab side. Every single day for the past couple of weeks, I've been going in, I want to get X, Y, Z accomplished. And it might be small, bite-sized tasks, but it's like, let's get it done. We had summer camps all summer with the NBA players. Again, let's get it done. Now we're looking to fall. I'm looking to winter. I'm looking to next summer, honestly, um, as I'm sure all of you are as well. And just like, let me get that win, and let me get one win for right now, and let me get one win for later. Thank you. Of course. Gentlemen in the blue right there, let's close yeah. this out. Yeah, yeah, we have a lot of strategies and other versus basketball, but also what you're saying, like people will think of us when you think of Kobe, you think basketball. Um, and we think of sports academy, the old sports academy, you would think of basketball, a lot of rookies train there. The biggest thing for us is Kobe is obviously the number one muse, right? Like Kobe Bryant, great. People hear that and it lights, lights, you know, it just lights people up. For us, it's like, all right, now we're instilling that second layer and that second level across all sports where we have if not ambassadors, then again, muses in all of those spaces where you can look up to him and A, associate him with us, but also associate him with greatness. And then the goal is to connect those two. So now you're thinking MSA and greatness. And um, we've been lucky where players want to work with us, whether that's because of Kobe, because of our amazing trainers, because of our amazing staff, because of Chad, whatever it is, we've been able to put people in across those multiple sports to where this past year we had, I believe, 20 draft picks in the NFL that worked out with us pre-draft. NBA, we had multiple first round picks working out with us pre-draft. To the point where, you know, it's bigger than basketball, like they say. Awesome, well, Sveet, thanks for sharing for your sure. story. Thanks for sharing your journey. And, Appreciate uh, thanks it. Everybody. Appreciate you guys.